<coughs> it's going to be perfect. Um, today's vlog is going to be on why illness is good. Now, this is going. I'm going to go a bit down an unconventional path today. I'm probably going to write this out in the form of a debate case. And I'm also, but I'm also going to shoot a video of it because in the event that it doesn't catch on in the community that I intend to present it to, namely the debate community, it'll be great to know at least that this argument is on YouTube uh, under my name. <coughs> now, I've been one to refuse medications of various sorts, um, especially since... Um, People have tried to force me to take psychiatric medications for an illness that I did not believe myself to have. So, this is going to be um, the crux of my argument. Well, there's not really going to be a crux to it. There are going to be multiple facets to it. And one of the, one of the facets of this argument that I'm making is that is that our attempts to stifle illness and to treat illness are anthropocentric. That is to say, they're based on humanism. They're based on this notion that the human being is at the top of this chain of being, and underneath are all these different gradations of inferior life forms. And depending on the service that they provide for the ideal human being, which is, as I'll be getting into, a hegemonic construct of what health is, um, uh, according to that, they can be viewed to be superior or inferior on the chain of being. So we say things like viruses, they're so remote from humanity that they can't even be considered living organisms. And we'll find a way of rationalizing that by how they reproduce and whatever, in the same way as we rationalize our subversion or we have of inferior uncivilized people by drawing analogies between their behavior and that of primitive species. And so... <coughs> it's essentially uh, estranging ourselves more and more from the natural world and the natural harmony of things, which includes, within the cycle of life, also death. And it's one of the reasons why many religions which are more rooted in nature than the Christian tradition, which conceives of a fallen nature, um, believe in practicing asceticism, sometimes exposing oneself to all kinds of what we call diseases, and unsanitary practices in order to come closer to God, which is conceived of as not as separate from nature, not as higher up on the chain of being or cleaner, but as actually informing nature and being present within it. Not through just some kind of pantheism reducing God to nature, but including nature in God, including God in nature. So it's really religious in origin, which leads me to the second argument for why uh, trying to prevent disease is usually bad. Um, this isn't to say that we ought not to be allowed to prevent disease, but when we force it and presume it to be the highest of ideals so that we aren't allowed um, to make a choice in the matter. And even if you buy into this nonsense, which I really consider to be uh, basically human-centered nonsense, that one member of a community can ruin it for everyone else by like failing to become strong enough, to become immune enough, which is really kind of a Nazi ideology in a way, if you think about it, the notion of forcing people to conform because it harms the strength of the collective, of the herd. And it's literally uh, what Nietzsche referred to as herd mentality. Herd immunity is just another reiteration of herd mentality um, as a philosophical idea. And it is uh, fundamentally, at the end of the, uh, the day, just an idea, which I'll get to maybe in another video in another moment. But when you... When you force people to conform to this, you're being hegemonic. Let me just get to, to the point. <coughs> this is something that Watts and Foucault talk about. How our idealization of health, our idealization of, um, of normative behavior, um, is always a result of some sort of power structure. This applies to both mental health, in the case of the idealization of reason over madness, <laughs> Um, and this is not the same thing as a kind of relativism. This isn't saying, oh, morality is just totally relative. Um, if, if you're crazy and you do terrible things, you shouldn't be judged. Because then, you know, how are you going to judge people who are suppressing madness as being immoral, right? It's not relativism, obviously. But it's rather saying, look, maybe we should keep in mind the possible benefits of being crazy. In the same way, maybe we should keep in mind the possible benefits of being sick, of having a virus, and not repress people. 
or try to have a systematic knowledge of it through the attempt to repress it, saying, oh, this is something that gay people, only gay people get, or predominantly, or predominantly African Americans, you know, so you can hate on these people, right? Oh, say, oh, he died of AIDS because he was gay. Oh, he died of AIDS because he was black. Oh, these other people who aren't gay or black, they died of uh, complex causes that are unknown. We're not going to presume it's AIDS, right? Because there's no such thing as absolute knowledge in science. There's just no intellectual since the 19th century has actually believed that. Science, the value of science is only, in, is only relative and practical. In, in other words, a technician can use physics in order to make sense of technology um, that is supposed to operate according to the principles of physics. And that's because the technology itself was designed along these lines. It's like imagine a musical technician operating a keyboard. A keyboard was designed according to our Western notions post-medieval, because remember they had a different scale of notes back then, of what, uh, of what music is. Namely, that it can be expressed in the chromatic scale, or a diatonic scale, or various variations of these things which give us different moods, which we recognize, it's like, oh, that's an Arabic scale, like an Arabic music. Or that's a pentatonic scale, like in Asian music. Unless it's a, it's a blues scale, which is just like in blues music, and then there's the blue note, it's the black keys, just like in the music that those black people made, you know? And that's, that's the ridiculousness of it. It's always a cultural thing. But, you know, you know we construct this notion of these laws of music, we call it musicology, and then you learn these principles, you know the names of the chords, right? Uh, whichever chords are official, because there are a number of different chords you could play which don't have names for them. And indie bands that have ostensibly never studied music theory, like Modest Mouse, are always innovating different sounds that we never fucking hear in classical music. But you know, you study this stuff, and then you come back to it, and, and you know how to operate the keyboard because you know the rules. But the keyboard was designed according to the rules. It's circular, right? And that's not bad that it's circular, but it doesn't prove an absolute out there. Like, you have to acknowledge that it's circular, and it's fine. But it, it's still artificial. So it is that our, our notions of health are artificial. Our, notion, our whole superstitions about what, pre what prevents death and what perpetuates survival is based upon our vested interest in survival. And notice that at no point in this consideration do people start to think, well, maybe survival isn't what we need. Maybe sometimes it's good to die. Maybe you have the right to die, such as in the notion of suicide. A physician assisted suicide is repressed. Why? Maybe sometimes you have the right to die, and it's not just because you're in pain. Maybe it's just you feel it's your time to go. I mean, dying is considered an art. In the yogic tradition, it's considered something that human beings um, do volitionally. They participate in conjunction with their bodies, they kind of descend into it artfully and shut down one after another of their chakras in the Buddhist tantric tradition and also the Hindu tradition, or what have you, depending on what your metaphysical way of conceptualizing your spiritual being and your body are. And since, um, as in Tuck Everlasting, or to use a Western literary example, or just in all of Taoism and Hinduism and Buddhism, death is considered uh, a part of life, you embrace it. Um, you don't try to escape old age into youth, you embrace it, as in Jungianism. Or consider what Deleuze was saying when he said everything is imminent, not transcendent. Death isn't some transcendent realm. Death is all around us. All around us we see things which are, are not formally living. And he was really influenced by Foucault, of course, so probably to develop this theory as well, unless he just came up with it. Because, you know, you could just as easily say that these ideas come out of the future as they do out of the past. Um, um, the thing about it is that, um, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that later, death and sickness, these are all aspects of life. Things enter into you. And as evidenced by suicide, including these very desperate suicides, which are attempts to reconnect with this deathly aspect, this thanatos aspect, also a lot of drug taking. Um, people aren't as interested in survival as they pretend to be, as they're forced to be. A lot of things people value more than survival, such as meaning, and when they can't find the meaning in life, which could be found in sickness, which could be found in drug taking, which could be found in insanity, 
they tend to turn towards death with a much greater fervor because survival just doesn't motivate them anymore. The human organism isn't motivated by the will to survive. This is not a scientifically proven concept. The whole notion of an instinct towards survival was actually developed by um, an Enlightenment-era philosopher. I can't remember his exact name. I think it was Spinoza. And Nietzsche criticized him, actually, saying, look, the will to survival is just one symptom of the will to power. It's really our desire... Um, and I do have to note that maybe uh, the, my video footage is going to run out shortly, so forgive me if it does, I'll make another separate video. Uh, it's our will to be involved, to have energy, to be involved in this interplay of energy, which more or less more for most uh, scientific frames of reference say this is what the universe is, so it has to be something that is within us, which is undefined. It's a subjective phenomenon, too. Um... Uh, and I'll, I'll address that in a moment too. It, it's this, it's this will to power that keeps us going, and our desire to create meaning in the world or to find meaning in the world. And survival itself doesn't do that. There has to be a desire to survive. This is why people in the military who've witnessed their um, their friends die develop survivors guilt, survivors guilt because they know intrinsically that this isn't fair. Why do those people die? Just like when when one person um, gets to be with a woman and another doesn't, but they both equally love her, you know, there's a sense on the part of one of them, if they're really noble people, why is that not me? And there's a sense on the other part of it, it's like, why is it me? And of course, one of the ways of meeting this is to see, well, who cares about the woman more? And then the other guy is probably an asshole for for um for allowing her to be seduced in his favor right but that's just the point um survival human beings don't necessarily have an intrinsic instinct to survival we're conditioned into it you know the the whole premise of post structural thought right incidentally i think i have like another 8 minutes probably um you know don't naturalize something which is artificial there are natural things we're not denying that but for the most part you know, uh, thing, things are things like survival are artificial ideals. They're artificial because they're one-sided. We made a choice to say, I would rather not die now. So, as a result of it, we try to develop medicine. And medicine by far predates the notion of science. Science comes out of the Christian church, which says God wants you to be alive for a plan. It represses suicide, represses all these things. You know, note Foucault, as a historian of ideas, developing all this, he says, look, things which develop in totally different fields of study independently have a lot of things in common because of trends. And if you're totally naive, you'll think, oh, no, this is a truth. They're all coming to arrive at the same universal. No, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, sometimes, yes, you might say there's such a thing as a moral universal. There might, you might stumble upon an aspect of human nature, such as loyalty, and more or less different individuals come to that independently and say, well, this proves it, right? Um, but usually in the fields of study that a lot of people are involved in, that isn't a personalized individual thing, which isn't like a shamanic journey of any sort to arrive at a common transhuman truth, um, <coughs> usually they're influenced by these trends in thinking, such as the, the will to survival, or the notion that God wants you to survive. So, out of, so medicine combines with science, and we use science to make sense of medicine. Incidentally, medicine, you don't need science for medicine. You can have shamanism. You can, um, I know a friend who actually was studying entomology, very science-oriented person, um, visited the Galapagos Islands, and also visited the Amazon, um, uh, and uh, I don't remember wh which it was in, but basically he was traveling and one of his companions got food poisoning, and he witnessed a shaman healing this guy by, in his words, westernized of course, because he, he wasn't picking up on the on exactly like what the spirits were or whatever. He basically saw this guy wave a, a, a plant in front of the other guy's face, and, um, and, the, and the other guy was healed within 10 minutes. Stop vomiting, all of that. Now this is considered a miracle. But what do Westerners do? You know, like, what do um, conquistadors, such as this guy, do? Actually, this guy isn't a conquistador. For those of you who can guess who this guy is, you see he's reading a book. Um, I applaud you. You're very educated. 
Um, but you know what? What do um, <coughs> what do Westerners do? They always say, "Oh, well, we we want to figure out why it is on our terms." So you study the plant and you break it down and you find out the chemicals in it and you replicate it. And maybe you give these chemicals to some people.